2020. I'm Marilyn Smith, Communications Officer for the City of Albany, and I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. City government takes care of a lot of the basics of everyday life that most people don't think much about. Clean drinking water, dependable sewers, and bus service for commuting and shopping. You'll hear today from two of the people who manage those functions, how their work has been affected by the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, and how changes in service may affect you. Chris Bailey is Director of Operations for the City's Public Works Department. Kristen Preston is the Department's Wastewater Superintendent. Before we get started, if you have questions for Chris or Kristen, please contact us through Facebook or email through the City's website where you can find up-to-date local, state, and national information about the virus. We'll start with Chris. Are public utility workers considered essential? Uh, for the most part, yes. Um, especially in the situation where we find ourselves now, water and sewer uh, employees are considered essential. Um, the um, basically public public works. A lot of public works employees are really public health employees, and we um, protect the public health by providing clean drinking water and transporting and disposing of wastewater. So we've put a lot of workers on telework agreements that we normally don't do, but for the most part, uh, public works employees are reporting to work as normal. Okay. Kristen, what are you doing differently to keep services working while social distancing? Well, uh, much of the work that we're doing is the same, but some of the changes for social distancing that we're doing is uh, things like staggering shifts, so having people come in at different times. Uh, we're limiting uh, work crews or field crews to one person per vehicle. Um, and then when they come back to the office, um, we're having them not congregate in uh, crew rooms or the lunch rooms. And then we're finding uh, individual work for them um, if we can. And if, they have, if they're working together, we try to have them work together, but separately and distanced. But if they do need to work in a sort of smaller space, we're promoting the use of masks and respirators. Um, and then some unique things at our wastewater treatment plant, um, it's very automated there, so a lot of the work can be done um, on a tablet or a laptop, and so we've assigned some staff to work from home, and so they respond to calls or alarms, and then they coordinate with the people who are working on site. Um, and uh, Albany has two uh, drinking water treatment plants, and so we're able to have people work in different locations. So that's uh, distancing just by where they show up to work. Um, and then the telework, uh, as Chris described, uh, the office staff who can work from home are. So those are some of the things we're doing differently. And actually, Chris and I have been um, on some web conference calls for uh, with other utilities around the country, and they're doing many of the same things, which is good to hear that we're sort of on par with the rest of the country. Okay. Chris, what kind of utility work is happening during this time? Well, I've heard from people saying that, you know, there's not enough, not much traffic in the streets. How about fixing potholes? Sure. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the regular water and wastewater work is continuing as normal. Um, the same goes for our street maintenance staff. They are all reporting to work and still doing their uh, regular jobs, such as street sweeping, um, filling potholes, uh, crack sealing, et cetera. Um, we have moved up some construction projects. For instance, there is a project that's going to be happening up on Gibson Hill Road. Originally, it was scheduled for the summer uh, in order to avoid conflicts with school buses. But uh, unfortunately, since school is out, uh, it's created an opportunity for them to get started on that project sooner. So we're trying to take advantage of those types of opportunities. Um, as far as doing street maintenance work, the limitation on street repairs is not really the amount of traffic. We can manage traffic through street closures and flagging and those sorts of things. Our, our main limitation is funding. We don't have extra funding to do street work at this time, so we're still continuing with our regular projects in that regard. Kristen, we've put mm -hmm. out some messages um, more than once to uh, tell people not to flush everything down the toilet. Right. Yeah. Are people following those instructions? <laughs> um, well, you know, people flushing other things um, down the toilet is not a new issue. And actually, we have this display here that we have uh, at the treatment plant showing all the things that we've found in the, the sewer system. 
Um, mostly it's toys, it seems like, and money and, and other things. Um, so yeah, we are putting out the message that only toilet paper should be flushed. Um, uh, there's, with the shortage of toilet paper now, there's some concern that people might resort to other things like uh, paper towels or wipes or, um, or, or things like that. And the issue is that toilet paper is designed to break down readily, whereas those other products like these wipes here, um, they're designed to be durable and um, they don't break down. And so the problem is that they can uh, accumulate in pipes and then sewage can back up into your homes or out onto the street which is a problem um, and if enough is in the system and it can accumulate and damage our, our pumps and infrastructure um, so which also can be expensive um, and so uh, we are uh, trying to get the word out that just toilet paper uh, and, and all those other things should uh, go in the garbage and if some of them do say flushable, but that is um, misleading um, for those reasons I just described because it can just cause damage. I would say we haven't seen a dramatic increase of issues, but we just want to make sure people get the word. Okay. How has this situation affected uh, the transit service? Yeah, transit really um, saw a noticeable change in service as soon as this started. Um, Albany operates two transit services, Albany Transit and the Limbit Loop. And um, in particular, when OSU and LBCC closed their uh, campuses, we saw a significant drop in ridership. Um, and this is uh, common across the country. You can Google uh, transit in any city and you'll see uh, a de decrease in ridership across the country. Um, so because of that, we looked at the routes that were still uh, having some kind of appreciable uh, rides and we changed our service. And we put it with the help of Matt, our graphics expert here, we put out a uh, limited service uh, routes on the internet and published those. So the services are still running, um, uh, but on a, a slightly reduced um, a level of service. We've also implemented things to try to protect our staff. So we have, um, on the buses uh, and paratransit, there's no fare collection happening. On the buses, we're boarding people through the back doors only, unless the passenger needs the lift. And um, trying to encourage people to maintain distance when they sit on the bus. The bus drivers also are authorized to not add uh, passengers when there are more than 10 people on the bus in order to try to keep some distance. Our paratransit service is running, and uh, I would say on both paratransit and um, the main public transit service, what we're primarily seeing is people who are taking essential trips. So trips to medical appointments or to uh, get food and um, or to go to work. And we've um, encouraged that the buses are running and there's no fare, but that doesn't mean that people should be riding them. As with everything else, uh, we'd like to keep people uh, at home to protect themselves and protect our staff and try to get through this as quickly as possible. Are we still offering the senior shuttle? I know a lot of the stores are offering special hours for people over 65 to shop when no one else is there. Are we offering that service now? Um, the senior shuttle operates through the paratransit program and um, so those rides are still available. I think we are um, coordinating rides through the reservation system, so people would want to call uh, the paratransit line to, in order to schedule a ride if they need that, and um, we can coordinate that service through them. Okay. Kristen, let's talk about utility bills. Okay. People want to know why we charge money for drinking water. Isn't water free? <laughs> Do you want to take the drinking water? Yeah, I'll take the drinking water one. Um, so uh, there's actually a lot that goes into making clean drinking water and um, uh, we water has typically been undervalued um, in our society and we've seen that in in many ways um, one of the challenges which is kind of a mixed blessing is that our water service here is very reliable for the most part when you turn on the tap water comes out it's good water it it tastes good it's it's clean um, and so that over time creates a sense of expectation of people. They just know it's there and they don't really think much about how it gets there. Um, so, but there's a, a huge amount of work that happens there. So 
starting from the source, um, we have uh, two sources for our drinking water. Both of them are on the Saniam River. One is on the South Saniam, one is on the main stem. And there are investments that the city has made in acquiring water rights for that water and in building the infrastructure that delivers the water to the treatment facilities. Those things all cost money to keep up. We have two drinking water plants. Um, they need routine maintenance, just like any other facility, a house or a business would need uh, maintenance over time. We have uh, about 240 miles of drinking water distribution pipe in Albany, um, multiple reservoirs, and all of those things take uh, money to operate, to maintain, to repair, and to plan for the future. One of the things I think that um, we gets lost sometimes is the work that the engineering staff does. So the engineers uh, design and manage the capital projects where we're replacing pipe or upsizing pipe um, and improving the facilities, but they also are doing planning work that looks at potential water needs out into the future. So we have a water master plan that um, defines what we believe we'll need uh, for decades and ensures that our kids and our grandkids here will have water um, just as reliably as we do. So all of that takes takes money and investment both in things that are consumed, power and chemicals and in people, um, education and training and, and in planning for the future. So it's actually quite an expensive uh, job. Okay. And I would say similarly for the wastewater side, it's a similar amount of infrastructure and staffing. Uh, the system basically works in reverse from the water system. We take sewage away from your homes uh, and businesses, and it's all routed to our wastewater, one wastewater uh, treatment plant where it gets cleaned and disinfected and then goes to our talking water gardens and then out to the river. So there's similar staffing to maintain all of that infrastructure and at the treatment plant um, and uh, maintaining all of that equipment and, and also the, the projection of, the same projection of usage uh, and uh, capacity for the future is done. So all of that, um, it takes a lot to, to do that and to provide you know, clean drinking water and provide it a system for it to be cleaned and returned to the environment. A lot of people are out of work right now and a lot of businesses are closed. Mm -hmm. How do we help people who might have trouble paying their utility bills? Sure. Um, so like many water utilities, we've suspended shutoffs for um, non-payment and um, uh, extended the amount of time people will have to repay bills. So um, if anyone is in that situation and is concerned about paying their water bill, they should contact our utility billing department. Um, the information is on the website. Um, we also have a low income assistance program for residential customers. It's been in place for many years. Uh, the basic qualifications are that the person who holds the account has to be either elderly or disabled and meet the income requirements that are um, set for the program. That's managed through Community Services Consortium and um, that program is also available if you find yourself in that situation. For businesses that are closed, I know there are a lot of businesses that have had to either reduce or close their operations. Um, we have a program similar to uh, the residential snowbird program where uh, it's easier to think about in my mind for people who may leave for several months in the winter and go someplace warm, they snowbird their account which means the account is suspended and so not only are you not being, um, there's no consumption so there's no consumption charge but your base charge is also suspended so you just don't get a water bill during that time. Um, we have a similar program for businesses. So if your business is closed and not using water or sewer uh, at this time, you can contact utility building and you know quote Snowbird your account and they'll help you through that process. Um, we're looking at other options we may have. I, this is we know this is just the beginning of this um, scenario, so we're trying to come up with other options to help residential and uh, business customers in town and uh, you should see more information about that as we, we figure those things out. You're both real people in your spare time. You have families <laughs> and, 
and homes. And how are you dealing with this personally, uh, getting through this with, with your families? Um, I, well, first of all, I feel really fortunate to, to have a job uh, and to do what we do. Um, so I feel really poor, badly for people who are out of work right now. But um, uh, personally, um, I am fine with the isolation, actually. I um, am rather introverted. And uh, as Chris and I always talk, we're Generation X. <laughs> so we were raised on isolation and neglect. <laughs> Um, resourcefulness. <laughs> um, so that part is fine. So we've been doing a lot of cooking and uh, walking around the neighborhood and do doing projects at home, that sort of th stuff. I, I do miss going to restaurants. Um, so we've been once a week ordering from a takeout place just to, so you know, on Friday nights to celebrate making it through another week. Um, and games, we've been playing games um, more than usual, it seems like. Um, so it's, it's actually, in a way, it's nice because we're just spending more time together, which can be, you know, aggravating at times, but also good. Okay. Yeah, similar here. Um, you know, we are still working, and um, this has been a, um, challenging to try to help manage our workforce through this and, and keep in mind what we can do to help the community. So that, that has been a blessing to occupy mm -hmm. quite a bit of time. and. Um, fill our days um, yeah so we uh, tried to we I have one helpful thing that we actually did that was um, uh, we dug out our emergency preparedness box that we had put together back when the Cascadia earthquake <laughs> scare came and so we dug it out and went through it and noted things we might need to to restock uh, and um, purchase in the future sometime but yeah, we've been playing games. I have a middle school age son, and um, now that school is officially closed, neither one of us are enjoying my new role as teacher. <laughs> um, so that's, it takes up most of my evenings um, trying to navigate that. And I, I always wondered how middle school teachers did it, and now mm -hmm. I'm even more unsure of how they ever make it through the day. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, it's fun. It's uh, it's good to spend time uh, with family. That has mm -hmm. been good, but it is a challenge, and I do hope we get back to normal. Yeah, whatever that is, sometime soon. I have a ten-year-old daughter, and um, we are doing this thing uh, like the summer passport program that the visitors association does. It's like a quarantine passport. So I've given her chores <laughs> and activities, and as she completes them, I stamp them. And so we're planning this um, pretend vacation. To Hawaii, London, and Italy, and so she's researching those places, and you know it's kind of you know creative and fun, and you know from our living room, basically. Yeah, my son's mostly playing video games, so <laughs> the difference there. <laughs> Girls and boys. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else that we didn't cover that you would like to mention before we close? Yeah, I think the main thing that I want to emphasize is, um, and I send out uh, emails to our staff and I mean I know everyone is sick of this and I, we're sick of it uh, too but we're we're not even halfway through this first phase of it um, mm -hmm. so if you think about it we in Oregon we haven't quite gotten to the top of the peak of, of cases and while we're doing really well um, compared to some other states uh, and that's that's a blessing and that's fantastic we're we're just not we have a long way to go so if you think about getting to the top of the peak we have to come down the other side and it's not like on your bike when you pick up speed um, right. it's gonna take a while and so I want to encourage everyone to continue doing what we've been doing it's clearly been helpful the curve has not risen uh, steeply we looks like the state has enough beds that they're forecasting and that that's all great news but we really need to maintain um, so that we can be done with this sooner rather than later because um, the the more we let up now the longer this is going to drag out and um, like everyone else we just want it to be over with as quickly as we can so I would just mm -hmm. encourage all of us to keep doing what we can to protect ourselves protect each other and and smash the curve mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. This will be broadcast on the city's website, Corona Resources uh, page, on YouTube, and all of our Facebook pages. Thank you for watching. <laughs>